So a virus is something that you can't see by normal light microscopy. You need very advanced techniques of electron microscopy to see it. But that virus is not able to reproduce itself without a host. And us as human beings are made up of lots of different cell types. And we are interested in understanding at the molecular level how that virus infects the liver and why does this infect the liver and it doesn't infect the heart or it doesn't infect other tissues. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetite for risk prompting wild swings in the prices of the key derivatives. It was the third day of frenetic activity in the European credit markets, suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Luzier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honor. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the contract patterns generator, CPG. This process pr produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in ways that produce running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from standstill to walking. Lawrence Stephen Lowry, RBS RA, was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pend Liberi, Lancashire, who lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial district of northwest England in the mid 20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes, people with human figures 
often referred to as Matchstick Man. He painted mysterious, unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits, and the unpublished Naryanette works, which were only found after his death. Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Miri, something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament, something we have to face up to as a nation? The ocean has been getting bluer, according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that give the ocean its green tint aren't doing well. Scientists say that because the ocean has been getting warmer. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it? The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views, by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens, whose wisdom may best discern the true interests of their country, and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people, will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves, convened for the purpose.
That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all. Because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hires a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final go-no-go decision on strategy. A majority of US high school students say they get bored in class every day, and more than one out of five has considered dropping out, according to a survey released on Wednesday. The survey of 81,000 students in 26 states found two-thirds of high school students complain of boredom, usually because the subject matter was irrelevant or their teachers didn't seem to care about them. Many different types of barcode scanning machines exist, but they all work on the same fundamental principles. They all use the intensity of light reflected from a series of black and white stripes to tell a computer what code it is seeing. White stripes reflect light very well, while black stripes reflect hardly any light at all. The barcode scanner shines light sequentially across a barcode, simultaneously detecting and recording the pattern of reflected and non-reflected light. The scanner then translates this pattern into an electrical signal that the computer can understand. All scanners must include computer software to interpret the barcode once it's been entered. This simple principle has transformed the way we are able to manipulate data and the way in which many businesses handle record keeping. To figure out these counterintuitive findings, the researchers conducted an experiment in a hotel room. They rounded up some lizards, gave them a perch, and then used a leaf blower to mimic the effects of high winds. They set up a net to catch any lizards that lost their grip. As the artificial wind blew, the lizards moved so the perch took most of the airflow. But their hind legs would stick out. And if those rear limbs stuck out too far, they acted as sails. Eventually, those back legs were blown off the perch, and the lizards were just holding on with their front two legs. And they could only hold on like that for so long as the wind speeds increased further and further until eventually they were blown off the perch and into the nets. So shorter back legs gave a survival advantage, a trait that might be passed on to the next lizard generation. Crows, she says, are what's known as partial migrants. Every year, some members of the population migrate between breeding grounds and their overwintering grounds, like parking lots. But others just stay put. So Townsend and her colleagues wanted to know if that urge to migrate was something individual crows can turn on and off. 
To find out, they captured 18 crows from overwintering spots in California and New York. They fitted the birds with little backpack satellite tags and tracked them for several years. Overall, three-quarters of the birds migrated, an average of 300 miles. And more importantly, if they migrated once, they did it every year, suggesting traveling is not a habit they switch on and off. The researchers also found that migrating crows returned faithfully to the same breeding grounds every year, but they were more flexible on where to overwinter, which could be a good thing. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. Well, in 2004, we integrated ticketing in southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper uh, ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in southeast Queensland, so bus, train, and ferry. And the second stage of uh, integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card. And the smart card will enable people to store value, uh, so to, to put uh, value on the card and then to use the card for travelling around the system. Hi everybody, this is Joe Biden. I delivered a report to President Obama laying out how far we've come since he put me in charge of the cancer moonshot. That was back in January. And to lay out a real vision for where we need to go in the immediate future, to, to do in five years what otherwise would take 10, to inject a real sense of urgency into the fight against cancer, and to change the culture and reimagine our system in order to be able to win. You know, when President Nixon declared a war on cancer in 1971, he had no army, he had no resources, and no clear strategy. But after 45 years of progress, funding research, training scientists and physicians, and treating millions of patients, we now have an army. And we have tools, powerful tools. And with the moonshot, we now have a clear strategy for the road ahead. It matters, folks, because there's a consensus now that we're at an inflection point with science, medicine, technology, all advancing faster than ever and offering real promise. But we can't play by the rules of 1971. We didn't have this working for us. Hi everybody. This weekend we'll dedicate the newest American icon on our National Mall. 
the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a beautiful building, five stories high and some 70 feet below the ground, situated just across the street from the Washington Monument. And this museum tells a story of America that hasn't always taken a front seat in our national narrative. As a people, we've rightfully passed on the tales of the giants who built this country, but too often, willful or not, we've chosen to gloss over or ignore entirely the experience of millions upon millions of others. But this museum chooses to tell a fuller story. It doesn't gauze up some bygone era or avoid uncomfortable truths. Rather, it embraces the patriotic recognition that America is a constant work in progress, that each successive generation can look upon our imperfections and decide that it is within our collective power to align this nation with the high ideals of our founding. There are a couple different stories you can tell about our economy. One goes like this. Eight years after the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, our economy has created jobs for 71 straight months. That's a new record. Unemployment has fallen below 5%. Last year, the typical household saw its income grow by about $2,800, the biggest one-year increase ever and the uninsured rate is at an all-time low. All that is true. What's also true is that too much of our wealth is still taken by the top, and that leaves too many families still working paycheck to paycheck without a lot of breathing room. There are two things we can do about this. We can prey on people's worries for political gain, or we can actually do something to help working families feel more secure in today's economy. Count me in the latter camp. And here's one thing that will help right away. Making sure more of our families have access to paid leave. Today, having both parents in the workforce is an economic necessity for many families. But right now, millions of Americans don't have access to even a single day of paid sick leave. When the time comes, its peers should follow suit. Of these, the European Central Bank faces the trickiest challenge, because it has acted as, in effect, the backstop to Eurozone bond markets, a mechanism that otherwise the currency bloc still lacks. But the main safety valve lies elsewhere, with banks and investors. Bitter experience has shown that debt-funded assets can magnify losses, causing financial crises. For this reason, banks must be able to withstand any reversal of today's high asset prices and low defaults. That means raising bank capital in places where it is too low, especially the Eurozone, and not backsliding on strenuous stress tests, as America's Treasury proposes. In the end, however, there may be no escape for investors from the low future returns and even losses that high asset prices imply. They and regulators should take a leaf out of the intelligent investor and make sure that they have a margin of safety.
So a lot of the research on happiness starts with the basic question, how happy are you? And we're psychologists. So tell us on a scale of 1 to 10, where 5 is average, 10 is super duper. The most common answers, interestingly enough, are high. They're 7 or 8. Um, it turns out that most people think that they're pretty happy. This question has been asked all over the world, and it turns out that there are slight differences depending on how old you are. There are slight differences depending on your place within a country. Um, California versus New York. There are slight, subtle differences between men and women at different points. Somewhat paradoxically, although women are more vulnerable to depression than men, still, on average, women are slightly happier than men. The Role of Family in Society Families are always related to the economy, the politics, the culture of the society. In herding societies, young people go out when they're 10 or 12 years old, and they hang out with the sheep or the goats, or whatever the herd is. That produces a kind of a loose bond between the pre-adolescents and their parents. In industrial societies, we tend to keep kids in school for longer, and then college is that point when they might break or after college, depending on what they're doing. In agrarian societies, families have lots of kids and put them to work. They structure themselves as large families and put them all together in one home. The main point is that families are not separate from the society. Families and the economy and the politics are all wrapped up all together. A really good illustrative example of the point I want to make is the book Journey Cake Ho by Ruth Sawyer, based on a traditional folktale. Teachers often read this aloud to their classes, showing the pictures to the children as they do so. They are, of course, using the words of Ruth Sawyer and presenting the story just as the artist has visualised it. But other teachers do it differently. Instead of reading, they tell the story from memory, this gives the children a much richer experience. They can freely use their own imaginations, visualising the story, the characters and the scenes in their mind's eye in any way they like. And this is much closer to the way in which folktales were passed from generation to generation, orally, without any words or pictures to restrict the imagination. We'll look now at a very interesting study. It was carried out by a researcher who works in two countries, Scotland and Italy, and it involved children from both of these countries aged around nine or so. Half of the children from each country spoke only their national language. However, the other half spoke their national language plus another language. During the study, all the participants were given tests and quizzes which looked at a range of skills including vocabulary understanding, problem solving, creative thinking and arithmetic. The children used their national language to complete the tasks which involved things like copying patterns of coloured blocks, orally repeating a series of numbers 
and giving clear definitions of words. The results were quite clear. The bilingual children were significantly more successful in the tasks. People rarely translate another person's unique way of saying things with any degree of accuracy. This is because when we learn the meaning of words, we pick up their broad meanings, but we've added subtle shades of difference which we get from our own personal experiences. If you grew up in an aggressive household, the phrase, I'm angry with you, had different associations than for a person from a family where people talked through problems. We're left having to work out meaning from our own experience. So, despite the fact that, say, Bob and Gina are both speaking English, Bob is really speaking Bob English and Gina is turning that into Gina English. And the translation is never going to be perfect. We miscommunicate more commonly than we communicate accurately. Often the words we have are at least somewhat inadequate to express how we feel. The first words we think of are often poor reflections of what we really mean. We might at times even want to take our words back for a second attempt. But once those words have left our mouths, our partners are already replying to whatever we have just said. Most conversations happen too fast to allow us to figure out what we really meant to say. It's been a challenging decade for the music industry, with a significant decrease in sales. For years, little action was taken against illegal downloads, with few effects for downloaders. However, two new approaches are seeing positive results. Firstly, the industry is working with internet service providers to slow an illegal downloader's connection. Secondly, it's working directly with digital music websites. In Sweden, Three out of five illegal file sharers have cut back or stopped, with half of these people moving to legal websites supported by advertisements. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometres an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track, but the jam spread backward around the track like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometres an hour. Real-life jams move backward at about the same speed. Now, as you know already, 
There will be a midterm exam next week. The exam will be an open book, open note, and open internet resource exam. But you can't use a classmate or me during the exam. Many of the questions on this exam don't have definitive answers. I wish to assess your critical thinking ability and your ability to combine ideas. A poorly organized answer will not get the same grades as a well-organized answer. Here are some good ways to study for the exam. First of all, it would be better for you to organize and review your lecture notes. That means you may need to compile notes and lab test results if you have not done that already. I strongly suggest that you write trial outlines before the exam. I think it will make you feel more comfortable. Just stop by my office. He about the same time was so much displeased with the performances of a nobleman's French cook that he exclaimed with vehemence, I'd throw such a rascal into the river, and he then proceeded to alarm a lady at whose house he was to sup, by the following manifesto of his skill. I, madam, who live at a variety of good tables, am a much better judge of cookery than any person who has a very tolerable cook, but lives much at home, for his palate is gradually adapted to the taste of his cook. Whereas, madam, in trying by a wider range, I can more exquisitely judge. When invited to dine, even with an intimate friend, he was not pleased if something better than a plain dinner was not prepared for him. I have heard him say on such an occasion, This was a good dinner enough to be sure, but it was not a dinner to ask a man to. On the other hand, he was wont to express, with great glee, his satisfaction when he had been entertained quite to his mind. They who beheld with wonder how much he eat upon all occasions when his dinner was to his taste could not easily conceive what he must have meant by hunger. And not only was he remarkable for the extraordinary quantity which he eat, but he was, or affected to be, a man of very nice discernment in the science of cookery. He used to descant critically on the dishes which had been at table where he had dined or supped, and to recollect very minutely what he had liked. I remember when he was in Scotland, his praising Gordon's Palates, a dish of palates at the Honorable Alexander Gordon's, with a warmth of expression which might have done honor to more important subjects. As for Maclaren's imitation of a made dish, it was a wretched attempt. When at table, he was totally absorbed in the business of the moment. His looks seemed riveted to his plate, nor would he, unless when in very high company, say one word, or even pay the least attention to what was said by others, till he had satisfied his appetite, which was so fierce, and indulged with such intenseness, that while in the act of eating the veins of his forehead swelled, and generally a strong perspiration was visible. To those whose sensations were delicate, this could not but be disgusting, and it was doubtless not very suitable to the character of a philosopher who should be distinguished by self-command. But it must be owned that Johnson, though he could be rigidly abstemious, was not a temperate man either in eating or drinking. He could refrain, but he could not use moderately. He told me that he had fasted two days without inconvenience, 
and that he had never been hungry. At supper, Johnson talked of good eating with uncommon satisfaction. Some people, said he, have a foolish way of not minding or pretending not to mind what they eat. For my part, I mind my belly very studiously and very carefully, for I look upon it that he who does not mind his belly will hardly mind anything else. He was for the moment not only serious but vehement. Yet I have heard him, upon other occasions, talk with great contempt of people who were anxious to gratify their palates, and the two hundred and sixth number of his Rambler is a masterly essay against gulosity. His practice, indeed, I must acknowledge, may be considered as casting the balance of his different opinions upon the subject. For I never knew any man who relished good eating more than he did. This being acquired and established, silence would be more easy, and my desire being to gain knowledge at the same time that I improved in virtue, and considering that in conversation it was obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue, and therefore wishing to break a habit I was getting into of prattling, punning, and joking, which only made me acceptable to trifling company, I gave silence the second place. This and the next, order, I expected would allow me more time for attending to my project and my studies. Resolution, once became habitual, would keep me firm in my endeavors to obtain all the subsequent virtues. Frugality and industry freeing me from my remaining debt and producing affluence and independence would make more easy the practice of sincerity and justice, etc., etc. Conceiving then that, agreeably to the advice of Pythagoras in his Golden Verses, Daily examination would be necessary. Postmodernism is, broadly speaking, a reaction against the movement or the period or perhaps simply the values and beliefs of modernism. Most people, even those who seem to know what it is or was about, tend to define it in negative terms by telling us what it isn't or doesn't do. Initially, the term had a fairly limited application and referred to a new anti-modernist style of architecture but it spread like a virus to include almost all aspects of contemporary culture. One thing we can be sure about is that it wanted to get rid of what were called the grand narratives by which we explained how the world and history got us from the past to the present. Another feature of postmodernism is its belief that truth and reality are human-centred and internal. That is, the primary source of truth in the present age is the self. This, I believe, has now all passed and been thrown in the rubbish bin of history. Yet it is difficult to know whether the age of information technology confirms the passing of postmodernism or is a consequence of it.
There is such a thing as information overload. There is just so much information out there now that we can't cope with it or fully absorb it, or even decide which bits of it we want to keep in our minds or which to discard. There is a similar thing going on with the range of choices we have as consumers. There is so much stuff out there, so much to choose from that, according to some experts, this situation is making us miserable. Most of us believe that the more we have to choose from, the better. Yet apparently, our dissatisfaction with this wealth of choice, or rather the anxiety it produces, is part of a larger trend. It seems that as society grows more affluent and people become freer to do what they want, the unhappier they become. Privacy and the right to privacy are increasingly becoming hot topics in the media, which is a touch ironic, given that it is often the media that is responsible for invasion of privacy. This is not just about those whose careers put them in the public eye, but ordinary people who, through no fault of their own, have come to public notice because of some event that has attracted the attention of the media. It might be that a member of their family has been imprisoned for some crime, rightfully or wrongfully, or perhaps they are the victims of some natural disaster. Some people argue that those who have chosen to be in the public sphere and have teams of public relations people to make sure they get as much public attention as possible—actors, rock stars, politicians, and the like—have given up their right to privacy and get everything they deserve. It is difficult to know how to place Montesquieu, if you're the kind of person who likes to categorize: historian, political philosopher, sociologist, jurist, or if you think the Persian letters a novel, a novelist. He was all these things. Perhaps, as some have, he could be placed among that almost extinct species, the man of letters. The books that make up the spirit of the laws have had the most influence on later thinkers, and in them. As in his equally great considerations on the causes of the grandeur and decadence of the Romans, he makes his underlying purpose clear: it is to make the random, apparently meaningless variety of events understandable. He wanted to find out what the historical truth was. His starting point then was this almost endless variety of morals, customs, ideas, laws, and institutions, and to make some sense out of them. He believed it was not chance that ruled the world, and that beyond the chaos of accidents, there must be underlying causes that account for the apparent madness of things. However simple or complex the chain of events in any given situation, when looked into, it usually reveals a train of causal relationships. They are seen to be linked in some way. The methods of analysis aim to establish these relationships and provide a solid background for useful generalizations based on what at first appear to be separate events. The first step in this process is to collect facts and then see if any particular patterns emerge. If they do. 
it then becomes possible to form theories related to the facts, and this type of empirical theory forms a useful basis for analysis and prediction. However, on its own, this theory is not enough. The essential second step is to test it by collecting more facts and by checking predictions against events. These new facts may mean you have to modify the theory, bearing in mind that new facts can only either disprove or support a theory. They cannot prove it to be right. There have been many studies in America of the opinions and behavior of university lecturers and professors and of well-known free or public thinkers who are not attached to a university or other institution which show that those who are recognized as being more successful or productive as scholars in their field or are at the best universities are much more likely to have critical opinions. That is to say that they are more likely to hold liberal views, in the American use of that word, than those of their colleagues who are less creative or who have less of a reputation. The better a university is, as measured by the test results of its students or by the prestige of its staff, the more likely it has been that there will be student unrest and a relatively left-of-center faculty. The growth of the modern state brought with it the development of mass political parties and the emergence of professional politicians. A man whose occupation is the struggle for political power may go about it in two ways. First, a person who relies on their political activities to supply their main source of income is said to live off politics, while a person who engages in full-time political activities but who doesn't receive an income from it, is said to live for politics. Now, a political system in which recruitment to positions of power is filled by those who live for politics is necessarily drawn from a property-owning elite who are not usually entrepreneurs. However, this is not to imply that such politicians will necessarily pursue policies which are wholly biased towards the interests of the class they originate from. The spinal cord, the link between the brain and the body, is a band of nervous tissue about the thickness of your little finger that runs through the backbone. Nerve cells called motor neurons convey electric impulses that travel from the brain to the spinal cord, branching off at the appropriate point and passing to the various parts of the body. Similarly, Sensory neurons transmit messages from organs and tissues via the spinal cord to the brain. But the spinal cord also functions without the brain having to intervene. It alone controls those actions called spinal reflexes that need to be carried out very fast in response to danger.
Paper was first manufactured in Europe by the Spanish in the 12th century, although it had been imported since the 10th century. Around the year 1276, a mill was established at Fabriano in Italy. The town became a major centre for paper making, and throughout the 14th century provided most of Europe with fine quality paper, which it has continued to produce ever since. By the 15th century, paper was also being manufactured in Germany and France, and it was not long before both countries became almost completely independent of material bought overseas. With the increasing availability of paper in Europe, the production of identical printed pictures became almost inevitable. Before farming was introduced into Scotland, people lived by hunting, fishing and gathering wild foodstuffs. This way of life meant that they usually didn't settle permanently in one place, but were to an extent nomadic, moving about in search of a livelihood, perhaps returning to the same places at certain times of the year. It is believed that the islands of Orkney were known to these people, but so far, only a few flint tools have been found to verify this. This is because coastal erosion has destroyed many ancient sites, and these may have contained relics of some of these earliest pioneering colonists. It isn't necessary to have a specialized knowledge of, say, the intricacies of counterpoint, or even to be able to read music to understand it. Usually getting the point of a piece of music, its emotional and dramatic impact, is immediate or simply requires you to become more familiar with it. Of course, prolonged study of music and its composition, as in any other field, will increase your understanding, but not necessarily your enjoyment. Now, I realize that it can require a good deal of willingness on our part to risk new sensations, and there is a lot of music that will seem unfamiliar and alien to you on a first hearing. To be honest, the biggest problem for most undergraduate students in terms of academic writing is not only adapting to a far more structured and formal style, but also learning how to ascertain the difference between important, valid information and unnecessary or even irrelevant material. In my experience, I would say it takes students their first year, if not longer, to appreciate what is required and to start to implement those requirements in their writing. What they really should be doing if they are struggling with written assignments is to seek help from the excellent support services which are available at the university. This week, we're going to be continuing our discussion of women in society. 
Last week, we looked at a number of issues relating to women in education. If you remember, we discussed women both at school and at university. Today, we're going to be considering the roles that women play in the workplace. Again, we'll start by taking a historical perspective, and inevitably you'll find that many of the same events that impacted on women in education also had a major influence on their working lives. In the second half of the lecture, I'll concentrate on the situation in Europe today, and I'll invite you to suggest how you think things are likely to develop over the next decade. Okay, so let's get started. Learning a language in the classroom is never easy, and quite frankly, it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start – they were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course language is one of those added but significant extras.